Welcome to this broadcast from the Church of Zero Status, of negative status, in fact, the Lord's Witnesses. We have no congregation to speak of, just a few people in a few countries. We've got a we've got hundred in Africa. We've got no buildings, no papal regalia, and a litany of false predictions. A few true predictions. But what we do have, which is of no interest to anybody at all, is the most accurate understanding of God's love and his doctrine for a church. He will save absolutely everybody, even those who are in hell, eventually. And we have the best understanding of any church at this present time of the scriptures, which you wouldn't see from our, well maybe you would, just from the fact that we're making these predictions actually, if you understood that the Bible actually being a history book and a prophetic history book does have prophecy in it. So if your church is not attempting to prof prophesy the future, it's not a true church, not at this time. Also, you have to be non-Adamic to be in a true church at this point. So unless your church professes to be non-Adamic, it's not a true church. And you need an Elijah with a water baptism who founded the church to be in a true church, unless your church has at least at least claims such a figure. Actually, that's not true, because the, the, um, the Watchtower had an Elijah in the form of Charles Russell, but he never claimed to be such. So, you, you, certainly you need some... Ah, so, you, I can't use that to prove anything. So, here is our, our next uh, attempt to predict the fire signs of 1 Kings 18, which fire signs will cause World War Three. The second fire sign will occur on Nissan 14, the Passover, or Nissan 15, the first day of Cakes. Uh, and that's because that's the 12th 1NC Pentecost from Adar something, first fruits in Adar, which I don't know when it was, I think it was 21. Not in Vieda, in Adar, yeah. And that will be a mushroom above, the, the mushroom cloud above either the Thames or the Hudson in Manhattan. And this, the third fire sign is Nissan 21 to 23, centred on Nissan 22, which is the sixth 2NC Pentecost of the Tishri one year, and the 2NC Pentecost of the Adar one, of the New Kingdom Adar one secular year, which we are under in honour of Jesus having raptured my 2NC brothers into the ark already on the Adar 15 to 18, although Time in the ark is a different dimension to down here, so when you're in the ark, no time elapses down here, so you can literally spend a day down here and then a day in the ark, and nobody would be any the wiser, because you come back from your day in the ark the exact nanosecond that you leave, or perhaps a microsecond, but not a, a gap of time discernible by a human. So it's a hidden ark, and those who go into it are hidden until they wish, or God wishes them to be revealed. That revealing is the apocalypse, which has not yet begun. It begins, well, I'm not sure whether it begins on the 14th, which is the Passover, which is when we now predict that this church will be raptured, or on the 20th, which is the beginning of the nine happinesses of the Sermon of the Mount of Matthew 5. The greater Sermon on the Mount is a sermon from the Ark, I mean, from people based in the Ark. It's a sermon on the ground, but it's... It, I believe, but it's based from people who are domiciled in the ark for the extra day you get. It's buy one day, get a, get one day free when you're in the ark. You have a day down here, then a day in the ark, then a day down here, then a day in the ark. We deduce that from Joshua 10, when the time stands still and the sun didn't set for one day, that day being the time that the time stands still for, for those in the ark. And that's when he was winning the battle, and we start winning the battle that we have hitherto been losing once we get into the Ark, because being in the Ark you see everything. So you can make a correct strategy based on perfect intelligence, which you cannot do down here because you get lied to all the time by the demons, who are brilliant at lying and deceiving. They're fantastic at it. So that means that 
the, the dates of these fire signs. The second fire sign, Nissan 1415, is April 15 to 17. It's the Sabbath, basically, Friday, Saturday, 15, 16, or Sunday, Saturday, April 17. And the third fire sign is the next weekend, which is the Sabbath is Nissan 21, which is April 22, and then 23, and then it could be 24, 25. It's April 22 to 25 seven days after April 15. So basically the second fire sign is this weekend coming and the third fire sign is the weekend after. And the, the World War Three begins on Nissan 21, the last day of Cakes, which is the third fire sign presumably, which would, that would indicate that the fire sign is in fact Nissan 21, but we've gone from Nissan 21 to Nissan 23 to be sure we get it, and as far as we can be sure. The reason that World War Three begins there, or one reason, is that it lasts for seven months of the seven uh, heating up the fiery furnace seven times of Daniel three, and that seven times ends on Heshvan twenty one, which is the two NC Pentecost of the Tishri one year, which applies to people not in the true church. But the eight R one year applies to non Adamic people, and that is exactly a month or a time after Tishri twenty one, which is the end of Hebrew summer. And the scripture says that in Daniel 7 and I think 12, that uh, as regards the rest of the beasts, a lengthening in life was given them for a time and a season. And that's after the, the globalist beast takes over. Incidentally, the globalist beast, the sea beast of Revelation 13, which is the terrible beast of Daniel 4, has now taken over all the ten kings, which are ten major governments, have sold out to this beast without telling their people, which is treason. They've all done it, if my biblical interpretation is correct. And if, if my biblical interpretation is incorrect, it's only incorrect as regards chronology, not as regards the sellout, because the ten kings give their power and authority to the beast over a period of 30 days, if my chronology is correct, which ended on Nissan 5, which was April 6, which was actually the date in Britain that the IDVTDBS UK regulations came into force. And what they are is a digital ID thing. IDVD is a Identity Document Verification Technology. Why can't they just give it a sensible name? It's just a digital ID. It's where instead of having to show up with a bunch of papers, on the spurious grounds of a pretext of Covid, you can uh, you know, upload them to a computer because the government really cares about you and wants to save you from the extra journey that you might have to make or the danger, the risk it would be for you to leave your house in this Covid environment. No, they're doing it because they want to get a digital ID in through the back door. And it's called the Digital Barring System and has been for many years, but it will be used to bar you from getting a job eventually if you don't have the digital ID and it will be used to bar you from renting anywhere, which is ridiculous. Why the government should require... Ugh. Anyway, and eventually it will bar you from doing anything if you don't have a digital ID and you won't get an ID unless you've got a vaccine. And that is the mark of the beast. That is our prophetic understanding. Whether it turns out to be true remains to be seen. But it began on the 6th of April, in the UK at least. So the rest of the beasts of Daniel 7.12 are the British lion beast, the Russian bear beast, and then the leopard beast, which has four heads, which are the uh, BRICS nations. The other four are other than Russia, the, the, the BIX nations. <laughs> the French Baro nations, Brazil, India, China, South Africa. And they pick up the pieces from World War Three, basically, by staying out of it, as does Germany to some extent. And the time and the season, the Hebrew season, Hebrew summer, runs from first fruits, which is the beginning of, it's the harvest season. The Hebrew summer is the harvest, according to the festival calendar, which begins at first fruits, on, which is Nissan 22 this year, and ends at the end of Booths, which is Tishri 21. And then you add that there's a time in the season, so you add another month that takes you to Heshvan 21. And the beasts, when they cease to exist, you can have a war. A war is a fight between two beasts. A beast is an animalistic nation that seeks to eat 
its neighbour, a carnivorous beast, if it's a carnivorous beast, which is what Russia is presently doing, the bear, which is a carnivorous beast. It's an omnivorous beast, I mean. And get up, eat much flesh. I don't want to go into the prophecy too accurately because it's too depressing. That lasts for 40 days from Adar 14 to Nissan 14. Uh, on Nissan 14, the Russian bear does eat much flesh. It has failed to eat much flesh so far in Ukraine. It tried to eat much flesh and didn't, didn't manage it and got beaten back to the Donbass or chose to retreat strategically to the Donbass. But there is no alcoholic who is satisfied with only one drink, unfortunately. And neither is there a megalomanic narcissist who is satisfied with only one conquest, or attempted conquest. So on Nissan the 14th, if my chronology is correct, the Russians start to attack countries and eat. The bear starts eating much flesh outside of Ukraine. And it's not entirely the Russians' fault, because there's a false flag, which is this fire sign. And this is all to do with the globalists. It's not to do... The, the globalists do what they do in all wars. They play one side against the other for their own benefit, which is effectively how the BRICS nations end up with all of this. So everybody in World War Three who takes part effectively loses. But those who don't take part win. And the reason for that is that war is obsolete and we shouldn't fight it anymore. You know, the First World War was man versus man, the second was man in machine versus man in machine, the third is AI in machine versus AI in machine, and that is such an abstraction from war as to have nothing to do with fairness, righteousness or anything. It's just a negative sum, total destruction. War is now, again, not worth playing and it should be outlawed. People talk about war crimes that are occurring in um, Ukraine on both sides, which is the inevitable product of a lawless environment, which war is. When you, when you have soldiers who are no... You know, Russian soldiers in Ukraine, they're not subject to Ukrainian law, and neither are they subject to Russian law because they're not in Russia. They're subject to the law of their generals. And if, if the general doesn't give them any law, they can do what the hell they want. And some of them, not all of them, most of them don't, I would imagine, but some of them will. And that's one of the terrible consequences, always has been, of war. But that's not the real crime. The crime is war itself. War is a crime. You know, if I assault somebody in this country, that is a crime. And if, if one country assaults another country, that also is a crime. It may not be regarded as one. It may not be punishable as one. I don't quite know how, how international law works, but it is a crime. And to, uh, I don't need to say this, but to displace all those, all those um, Ukrainians and cause all that heartache and death and destruction and injuries is despicable and what, what for? For another inch of land? Uh, Russia is the biggest country in Europe, possibly in the world, it's massive, it's huge. They don't need any more land, they need is some morality in their leadership. They've got it in the people and we all, the whole world needs that morality actually, it's not just the Russians and the globalists need it the most. Yes, so that's why World War Three ends on Heshvan 21, one month after the end of Hebrew work summer. And therefore it begins seven months before that on Nissan 21, which is not this weekend, but next weekend. So there's my glorious message. The good news is, following John Lennon's song, it's the last war that the world and mankind ever has, because it's so destructive. We're like the, the boy who can't decide whether, to, whether it's a good idea to put his finger in the fire, so he puts his finger in the fire and then he goes, ha, that wasn't a good idea. We don't seem able theoretically to deduce that war has passed its sell-by date. We don't seem to be able to deduce that, although it's blindingly obvious. The offensive capability is too great, the defensive capability is non-existent. You know, you need to have a house that uh, is built underground these days. You know, there's no point in having a house that's above the ground because a hypersonic missile can destroy it and there's nothing you can do about it. So, until we, we stop making hypersonic missiles and all forms of remote killing, in fact, we are dicing with self-extinction. Self and that, that's what... And we, we have to learn that lesson, and unfortunately, the only way to learn it appears to be to experience it. I mean, I'm sure there are millions of people who have learned it, but regrettably, there's always a bunch of idiots who haven't, and there's never a shortage of them. I mean, fortunately, in a way, that's the lesson that 
we're going to learn. The bad side is that the amount of pain we suffer as a species is exactly equal to our hard-heartedness and our tardiness and our reticence to learn that lesson. If we'd all learn that lesson, we wouldn't need it. So the amount of pain and suffering that you see, first in Ukraine and secondly worldwide as a result of World War Through, is caused not actually by the globalists, not by the Russians, not by any participant in the war, it's caused by man failing to outlaw war and make war a crime, which it is. And it should have been made a crime after World War II at the latest, possibly after World War I, really. I mean, that's what the UN and League of Nations tried to do, but they failed spectacularly, totally failed. War is a crime. If mankind realised that, we wouldn't have to have this lesson we're going to get, but the, to, the, to the extent that we haven't grasped that, that is the extent of pain and suffering we're going to suffer as a species. And it's also a crime to invade your neighbour's territory. In America you can shoot somebody who invades your house and that is got from God's law. If you see a guy in the act of committing a theft, in the act, and you tackle him and in that tackle he gets killed. I mean you're not supposed to just shoot him, you're supposed to warn him and say don't do it and blah blah blah. But if he gets killed in the act of burgling by some guy who's trying to stop the theft, there's no blood guilt. And the same would be true actually for a country invading another country. That doesn't mean you should shoot prisoners. Prisoners have stopped invading. The Ukrainians should not shoot Russian prisoners, for God's sake. Once they've given up, you should attempt to look after them. A war is a lack of morality. You don't win it by being immoral. I mean, you might think you win it, but you reap what you sow in this world, and God ensures it. The, the interesting thing about now is there's so little time left in the world that you will reap what you sow almost immediately. So war is completely pointless for Russia. If they succeed in conquering, everything they've conquered they'll immediately lose because you reap what you sow. And you reap what you sow in almost no time now. So it, it, it's an absolute waste of time. But, it's not, but it is a lesson we have to learn. Anyway, so here are the chronological things that we've recently worked out. Once we get into the Ark, the nine happinesses of the Sermon on the Mount begin. It's nine months of being taught from people based in the Ark. And they don't teach you in the Ark. Well, they do. You, you get taught both in the Ark if you're in it, or you get taught on earth if you're down here. And incidentally, the Ark is the means by which God protects his people from World War III because the fourth horseman of the apocalypse does not have authority to kill people who are God's people, who are, have faith. That doesn't mean they're Christians, it's anybody with faith in God. Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, it doesn't make any difference, any religion. If you, if, or not religion at all. If you just have faith in God, yourself, as a person, as a one-person church, that's good enough. He will protect you in, in this, in some way. I mean, you don't get total protection until you get into the ark. But the, there's nine months of this Sermon on the Mount, the greatest Sermon on the Mount, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing, and it's the apocalypse, basically. It's the revelation, because from the Ark we get to see everything, and we start explaining the truth to all of mankind who will listen. Presently, hardly anybody listens. So, that, so the nine happinesses of Matthew 5 begin from actually Nissan, either 14 or 20, I think it's Nissan 20, and go to Tebeth 14 or Tebeth 20 this year, which is, Tebeth 14 is the absolute end of Adam, the end of the first death, uh, people stop dying on Nissan, the last person dies on Tebeth 14, which is actually January the 10th, but it's this year Hebrew, next year Gregorian, so that's one beautiful thing. The next thing is Heshvan 14 is the date, 2014, when this church beca became Isaac, it's a really important date because 2 times 12, 90 days after Heshvan 14, 2014, is Tebeth 14, 20, 21, which is the end of Laodicea and Adam, which is the end, which is the second crop. Because um, the first crop of Revelation is Laodicea becoming non -Adami. The second crop is the Watchtower and the late Laodiceans. So the last Laodicean with faith, FRC, Faith Ransom Covenant Seal, Faith Sealed, one ACs, from Laodicea, the last one, leaves Adam and becomes non Adamic. Tebeth 14, 2021. And that is 1290 days of Daniel 12, after the loss of the constant feature, which we, because we lose, when we become Isaac on Heshvan 14 to Heshvan 16, we die to Abraham and become Isaac without going into the first death because we're non Adamic. 
So at that point, a constant feature ends, we're unappointed because we're no longer the guy who was appointed. Well, we changed from being Abraham to Isaac and then got us to reappoint Isaac. But 1290 times two days after that, because it's from the moving of the constant feature and the placing of a disgusting thing causing desolation, and so it's maximally distributed. So you take it as two times 1290. That takes you to 2021 Tebeth 14, which is the second crop of Revelation 22. And then the twelfth crop would be 10 months later, which is Heshvan 14 to 16. And that's the end of the crops of the Tree of Life. It's not quite the end of Adam, there's two more months till the last chance salute because God is always more merciful than you imagine. It's always certainly more merciful than any church has ever imagined. Maybe the Unitarians are close to it. Not the Unitarians. The, um, what are they called? Universalists, sorry. Universal salvation, they believe in. And they're right, because God gives up on nobody. Mankind throws things away. God doesn't. So that's the Heshvan 14. That's the nine happinesses. And there was one more chronological thing I wanted to speak about. Yes, 2 Kings 1, the fire that eats up the 50s, so 2 Kings 1, inextricably linked to 1 Kings 18. The chief of the first 50 and his 50 was the first fire sign of 1 Kings 18. It was the 2 NC Pentecost from uh, Tissue 2 to Heshvan 21, 2010, and then the late 2 NC Pentecost was the chief of the 50, which was Chislev 21, 2010, and the, the great big fire in Mount Carmel on Israel, in Israel, on Mount Carmel was Chislev 20 to 23, killed 24 people, worst fire in modern Israel's history. That was the fulfillment of 1 Kings 18, which was set on Mount Carmel in Israel. Then the second fulfillment, which is the, well, the second and third fire sign are fulfilled in the chief of the second chief of 50 and his 50 which is the sixth to NC Pentecost from Adar 2 to Nisan 21 counted in BLC days from Adar 2 2021 to Nisan 21 2022 and Nisan 21 is the third fire sign but Elijah says to them the chief and the 50 if I'm a man of the true God let fire come down from the heavens and eat up you and your 50. Speaking to the chief, he says to them, which means two things. It means the chief is inclusive, so so the chief actually is a part of the 50, whereas in the first fire sign he wasn't, it was exclusive. Secondly, it means there are two 50s, actually, because he said it to them, plural. One is the second fire sign, which is occurs on Nissan 14, which is the day after the sixth Sabbath of the Pentecost. Which is during is what it has to, the fire has to eat the fifty and the sheep. So the third fire sign eats the sheep, and the second fire sign sign eats one of the days of the fifty, which is Nissan fourteen or fifteen. I think it's fourteen. And Nissan fifteen is the one um, NC, the twelfth one NC Pentecost counted from. I'm not quite sure where Ada or something, whichever first fruits was in Ada you know, after Adar 14, whichever one it was. I think it was Adar 21, but I can't remember. After Putin invaded, Putin invaded on Adar 14. Sorry, he didn't invade. He recognized, <laughs> he, he signed an agreement with himself, granting independence from Ukraine unilaterally without consulting Ukraine to Lugansk and Donetsk in a, an absurd piece of bureaucratic theatre which had no basis in any form of law but nonetheless was his justification then for sending in his peacekeepers who were these most spectacularly unsuccessful peacekeepers in the history of military conflict which is another lie so that these peacekeepers were sent in and, and he declared that these two provinces to be no longer part of Ukraine on the 14th of Adar, and at that point he fulfilled Daniel chapter 7 verse 5, where three ribs are in the mouth of the bear. These three ribs are three provinces out of the 26 provinces of Ukraine. The three ribs being Lugansk, Donetsk and Crimea, which shows that God himself, through his prophet Daniel, regards those three ribs as being part of Ukraine, which shows that God regards Ukraine as a country, 
unlike the lies from Russia, which is saying, oh no, Ukraine isn't a country, it's just a, just a you know, bunch of land that really should be ours, or some ridiculous argument. So, tragically, that scripture has now been fulfilled on that day. And then you count your 30 days from there of, of, of they, the scripture ambiguously, deliberately ambiguously says, they say to the bear, get up, eat much flesh. And in one meaning, it's, it's the Crimean people, the Donetsk guys and the Lugansk guys, who are the separatists who are fighting for their independence from Ukraine, uh, who are, of course, actually insurgents. I mean, <laughs> incredible world we live in. You know, you go and make a peaceful vote fraud protest without any arms at all in, in the capital on January the 6th, uh, having been let in by the FBI and the police walking in between the red ropes, causing no threat to anybody, and just wanting to maybe sit in uh, Nancy Pelosi's desk or walk around with her lectern or some other act of defiance to say that you are unhappy with vote fraud, which, is, which you have every right to say, because the whole thing is supposed to be a democracy, and there was massive vote fraud. And that's called an insurrection when there was, there was no insurrection. It was a peaceful sit-in which didn't last very long. And then you make up stories that people got killed and, and absolute nonsense. They didn't. Three had medical emergencies and died of that. One guy didn't get hit with a fire extinguisher who, was, who the press dishonestly said he was. And so it goes on. The only person who got killed was a, a woman who was posing no threat to anybody who got shot without warning by a trigger-happy security guard who created a death. Anyway, that's supposed to be an insurrection, but then you have a real insurrection, which is egged on by a foreign Russian, <laughs> Russian interference. If you want Russian interference, look no further than Ukraine. And, and it's, it's called a separatist movement. <clears throat> I mean, sure, I mean, give them, if they want to be separate, give them a, res uh, give them a, give them an, in I, I believe if people want to be separate, they should be, give them a referendum, yeah not run by Russia, not run by Ukraine, it would have to be run by, I don't know, Sweden or Switzerland or somewhere who can be trusted, if there is a country who can be trusted to conduct a free and fair election in this world anymore. So there's 50, there's a Pentecost, the 12th one in C Pentecost for the second Fasa, and then the 6th, 2 in C Pentecost for the third Fasa, and those are the, actually two 50s, um, who, which are both consumed. But the, the, the chief of the second 50 and the second 50 is, is the sixth 2NC Pentecost with inclusive chief being the Pentecost himself, itself. And that has to have two fires during it. One at the end of it and one on Nissan, on Nissan 21 and one on Nissan 1450. And then the third chief of 50 of two kings won is another Pentecost, which is actually the Zohar Pentecost. Because all these Pentecosts are sent from Ahaziah to Elijah in the account. But the way the account words it is, he sent him the 50. Which means that in the greater meaning, because it's deliberately ambiguously worded, all possible ambiguities have to have a meaning in Scripture. So because it says he sent him, and because in the original account it was A sending to B, in the, in the greater meaning, the original meaning was A to B, in the greater meaning is B to A. So Elijah sends Ahaziah, who is the watchdog governing body, all these Pentecosts that they did not know existed. They didn't know there was a 12th 1NC Pentecost, hardly any, or no church knows that, and they didn't know there was a 2NC Pentecost, and they didn't know there was a Zohar Pentecost. The Zohar Pentecost is the third 50. And he says, you know, let my soul and the soul of my 50, these 50 servants of yours, actually, be precious in your eyes. And that's because we all get raptured during the, his 50. And, you know, when you're raptured, you're, it's because the soul is precious and treated as such. And, and the soul, you don't lose your soul if you get into Zohar. My soul shall live on, said Lot. Let me flee there. It is a small thing. And this church is the smallest church there is, I'd imagine, or one of them, with the biggest understandings. Then it becomes, eventually, the largest church, actually. Bigger than the Catholics it will become. Half of mankind will be in it. I mean, half of mankind has faith, you know, because there were two men in, in the, where were they? Working somewhere in the field. There were two men in the bed, actually, 
that isn't fate, that's uh, love. <laughs> the, the two women grinding at the mill and two men, I think, in a field. One taken, one left behind. That's a 50-50 split. Half of mankind has faith. So when I write an article and put in biblical stuff, it's of interest to 50%, certainly, of readers. So don't think that nobody's interested in the Bible. Half of mankind is interested in God, certainly, and therefore, presumably, in the Bible, too. So those are my three chronological things. I mean, we've, we've got more. We've got the 70 weeks now, which is all doubled, just like I doubled the 1290. I mean, incidentally, if you double the 12, the 1335, counting from Heshvan 14, 2014, you end up on Nissan 14, uh, 2022, which is two times 1335 days after Heshvan 14, 2014, and that's um, when uh, I stand up for my lot at the end of the days. And happy is the man who reaches that time because he gets raptured into the ark. And the way I stand up for my lot is by being raptured into the ark where my wife, the 2NC saints, is already there because the wonderful scripture says, a house is what I shall build for you. Thank you.